That's free firewood in my book. Free firewood? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to have a few, few of those out there. A lasting metal of some description that goes on forever. So there's those blind spots that everybody has. And it's trying to work out, okay, have I covered all the blind spots? In the room, 52 Jokers Wild. At this time of year, the sun normally comes out and it's nice and bright and everybody loves to go into their garden and start messing around and doing all kinds of stuff that the bear does in the forest and <laughs> it's, it's it's that time of year where you kind of go right it's right and nice and breezy and you, you feel excited and you want to go and do something but do you just let it happen or do you design it and craft it and make something of it you know that's the kind of thing are we architects or are we just gardeners what do you think going well you touched on it in the sentence immediately it's do something what's something nothing if you walk out the door without a plan, you just look around, you start doing anything. And anything is not, equal. it might be a something, but an anything is not necessarily the thing you're meant to be doing. Now, I've said it many a time in some of our shows, don't do a nothing in a, in a no thing time. Do anything. But if you're going to do anything, why not do a meaningful something? Because you've only got so much of your life left. Or even if you're at the start of your life or at the end of your life, it's why do just anything or something when well, you can be doing the thing you want to do? So, I uh, know you like you're talking about the garden and going out there and go, I can mow the lawn. There's things that have to be done versus the things I want to do. At the moment, it's the hanging gardens of Babylon out there since the last time I got the mower out. The grass is about a foot high. I'm going to have to figure out how to tackle the grass, not design the landscaping or the, or, the, or the Covent Garden or the Chelsea Gardens. I'm just happy if I can get the grass down so I can actually walk on it. Now, that's a something I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to find a some time to do it. And it's the first thing that probably needs to be done, as my wife says, that, you know, to get to start the gardening, I go, I drive around in circles in the middle over the grass in a big machine and I think I'm doing the gardening. I'm not. The gardener might be or my wife might be because she's out there laying the lawn, sowing the seeds, planting the, the, the potatoes and, and, and cleaning and drilling and, and all the rest. I'm going around in circles with a hat on, on a big machine going, I'm doing the gardening. I'm doing something. But her, I might as well be doing anything else because I'm doing nothing of importance. I need to plan. So back to you, George. It's have a design, have a purpose, do a meaningful something in that time. Well, I know that we have uh, a garden fence that's been up for about 25 years and we've, we've done other fences. And this fence, we're sitting there kind of going, actually, it's starting to fall apart. The, the the wind has got at it, the elements have got at it. I'm sure the little woodworms have got in there and eaten it away and it's starting to turn to dust. It started off in dust and it's now going back to dust. So we have to plan what we're going to do. What's our strategy? How are we going to tackle it? And we already started to work out, well, okay, we've got one neighbour we know is a bit kind of, mm -hmm, hopefully we, 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 we can have some kind of discussion with them and at least let them know that when we tend take the fence down our side, which we actually put up, hopefully they won't start suing us and going to their solicitors because we've now deprived them of their their fence. But we're kind of going, it's been up there 25 years. It now We now need to do something so it doesn't topple in on, on top of you and, and kill your dogs and, and all the other things. We've already had a, a tree fallen down because we hadn't planned, they not, not us, but them. And we were worried of what it was going to actually fall upon. That's free firewood in my book. Free firewood. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to have a few few of those out there. But we're, we're having to plan. Where are we going for the next 25 years? We want to stay here. This is our home. But for us to do that, we can't just stop and do nothing because it will all fall down around us. So we have to plan for the future. A bit like having a pension. We have to plan for the future to make sure that we've got something there that will stay secure during this, la this next 25 years of our life, hopefully in this place. But my wife started thinking, right, we've got to get rid of, we've got to take out the, the windows. We've got to take out, you know, the, some of the rooms and change them around and we'd like all this, but have we got the budget? That's the next question. So we now need to get somebody to come in and to plan whether or not we have enough budget to cover all the costs of what's going on. So we, we don't want to jump in just yet and start floundering with stuff. We want to work out 
what's it actually going to cost? And if we get somebody else in, because I could start it off and then get distracted because I'm doing something else with Garvin, which is more enjoyable, and then find that we haven't done the job and we're in a worse situation than we would have been beforehand. So that's the key, isn't it? Is to make sure you don't jump in. And that's the idea, because a lot of the discussions I've been watching around about script writing and stuff like that is, are you an architect? You start and plan and structure and within that, you've got some room to be creative. Or would you just let it happen and see what see where it goes? And what may happen is that you get so far along in your story that you then get lost. You get lost in the forest and then you meet that grizzly bear that's got his beer. You know, because that's what a lot of writers do. They start off, they're all excited, they know where they think they're going, and then they haven't planned the journey. And it's like, you know, any kind of journey that you go on, if you've got a road map, you know where you want to get to, you know where the outcome is supposed to be. And you know that you may have plotted it along certain roads, but there may be diversions. And what you're trying to do is to get back onto target so you can meet your expectations. And I think that's the key. It's the expectations. Do you know what you want? Do you know what your expectations are in getting to the end result? And if you do, then, as we've discussed before, you can start to visualize that and sort of kind of go, right, now I've got a concept of what it is that I actually want. But without that visualization, you may as well just be you know, just throwing your arms up in the air or doing other kind of things, you know. <laughs> but no, basically, you, you use an awful lot of business language, which again is playing in parallel to the story architecture, because we're saying the story of a business and the story of a story of a script or the story of your life, it's all the same thing. It's what's your vision. You know, where do you want to go? If you've no vision, any road will do. You'll get there because you don't know where that is anyway. Now, realistic expectations. You, you can't arrive in the penthouse in New York, as we said before, unless you accidentally win the lottery, unless you're doing something that in your career path will lead to those being realistic expectations. Now, you talked about the story and the visualisation. Now, at the very beginning of the conversation, you were saying, Let's in, you're investing time. Now, time and or money. I was hearing at the very beginning my business language of CapEx, capital expenditure. You're buying a house, you're investing in windows and doors, things that have a life beyond a couple of years, garden fences, you've got 20 years out of it. You know, it's, it's, you're, if you're buying something from new, someone's moving into a brand new house, they're buying the big buy, the big capital expenditure, the big investment, and the, how they finance, it might be a mortgage, it might be money, it might be an inheritance, but they're buying the, the big capital item. Now, if they just buy it and move in and don't do any repairs and maintenance as they go, it will literally fall down around them over that 20-year journey, as opposed to tap tapping away, on, give a lick of paint to that window, keep the water from ingressing in, protect the fence, give it that, you know, that, that does what it says on the tin, so one coach does all, you know, keep the moss away. You know, that's in the business language, you invest in your capital items, but in the same time you set up a maintenance schedule and you invest in the repairs and ongoing maintenance. So you keep, you make the longevity of the life of that asset, if it's a car or a truck, or if it's a house, it might have a hundred years. If it's a car or a Jeep or something, it might have a 10 year life. Not if it's doing 400,000 miles a year, but even if it is, if it's properly maintained and repaired, you can expect it to have a good life. And when it gets to the end of its natural life, then you buy the next one. Not quite like a house, unless it's fallen around, down around you. Then you have to nearly build a new one. Or the capital expenditure to refurbish it is more than the cost of it. And that's where you have insurance games where you say, what's the replacement cost? You might have bought it for 100 grand, but it could cost 200 to replace five years later because building costs have gone up. It's what is it going to cost to put you back in what you just lost? Now, for you to move yourself in that timeline, sometimes people want to move from A to B and they realise selling where they're selling could get them 200 grand. But what that buys them where they're going might actually be less because they're selling costs and buying costs, movement costs, and they end up with less money to buy what they thought was going to be an upswing. So unless they're moving down the country or out of a locality, then effectively you're not going to get the same value for money unless you travel back in time and go to a further further land further away but the big thing here is like buying a house writing a story invent or, or going on a life journey it's invest your time wisely invest your resources wisely 
Make sure you have a repair and maintenance schedule for yourself in terms of health and wealth in the sense of you know, keep healthy, you won't have the big health bills. You're doing repairs and maintenance. Keep yourself, you know, keep the house painted, keep it repaired. It'll look well and it'll stand the test of time. So we have to stand the test of time. Our assets have to stand the test of time. But our vision also has to stand the test of time. Our vision board might change with time and realistic expectations. But invest your time and money wisely. Now, there are some people that are, they, they're not interested in, in the architect side of things. They want other people to suggest where they go. And that's okay because... You know, without those, if you like, the workers, you, you, you don't have the people that are doing their tasks. But one of the things I started to think about this morning was that as we're developing our architecture for the Film Production Academy, we have more recently been in a position where we've had to take on, we've taken on a couple of interns and it's put us into the role of the kind of employer, the boss, they're calling us bosses and things. But we then have to make sure that the maintenance of our vision in a number of different areas are actually quite strong because we then have to pass that vision on down to them so they get a real sense of this is solid. I feel as though I'm doing something. I know what I have to do today in this little portion of what I'm doing and I know it's moving things forward for the guys ahead. And that's all they need to focus on and that's all we need them to focus on. And I think that becomes important that you then understand what the what the global or gestalt uh, vision of what you're trying to achieve is actually pretty solid and is actually on a really good solid foundation. So we're back to that building again, the architect, which I think is really quite important because you're trying to work out how to get that structure. Now we're setting up hierarchies. It's still another structure. And within that hierarchy, you need to make sure that each part functions as it should do so that it can keep the engine rolling for the whole journey to be sustainable. Because it's no, it's, no, it's no point going on a car journey and sort of kind of going, I've got 400 miles to go, and you put enough petrol or diesel into the car, and it'll only get 200 miles, and then you run out, and you're stuck in the middle of nowhere. Again, it's planning for that journey. How do you get the fuel going in there? How do you motivate, in this situation, the people that are working for you to make sure that they stick to the vision that you have and believe in that vision and want to go with you on that journey and actually feel that they can relax and allow you to lead them in the way that you want they you want to actually go and i think that's that's something that we've we've learned i think recently especially myself and i think that's really good in collaboration where you've got someone like i've got garvin that i can talk to hopefully he feels he can talk to me <laughs> about various different things but the conversation that we have the, they're not necessarily coming from the, the same perspective. It's looking at looking at things from different angles that you then sort of kind of, well, actually, if you move this side, you can see there's a slight issue there that you might have been blinded. So there's those blind spots that everybody has. And it's trying to work out, OK, have I covered all the blind spots? Have I gone all the way around the structure to make sure that all those things are sound? Is there, is there an element that could be about to break that could actually have the whole thing topple over like a house of cards? Or is it sufficiently, is there enough redundancies in there that if one little bit goes and, and we can get to it, the others will actually keep it still afloat while we're while we're trying to just remedy that situation? And again, you're talking about the maintenance side of things. And I think that's where we're constantly having to keep reviewing what's going on to make sure that it's sound, to make sure the village vision is a strong vision, a sound vision. And as we get more and more into what that vision is, we are trying to verbalize that vision into a more and more concise story. And again, it's all about storytelling because everything's all about storytelling, whether you're actually telling a film or writing a book or actually trying to build a house or even trying to plant the seeds in a garden because you're trying to manage the way that garden works. And at certain points, the, the daffodils will rise. And at other points, the roses will come along. But you might get the ivy coming in over the wall that could damage everything and actually soak everything and kill all the other plants. So you need to make sure that you you fight that back and keep that away from you so it doesn't disrupt your your plans within the garden. So it is a constant maintenance thing. It's a constant battle to try and sort things out. And as we are going into sort of business, we have to be careful of what are the, we know what the opportunities are. We know what, 
We're looking to see what the threats are that could undermine what we're actually trying to do as well. But we're also, it's, it's the SWOT analysis. I've forgotten what the S and the W are, <laughs> but there's the, there's the opportunities. Strengths and, and weaknesses. Strengths, strengths and, weaknesses. and weaknesses. And there's, there's my weakness. I've just forgot. My whole mind went completely blah. So there you go. That was, that's just, There's it's only four letters you have to remember. <laughs> I know. And I, got, I got them back the to front. That was the dyslexia got in the way there. But that, again, is quite interesting. Yeah. That, again, is why you need the other person that's there. Just because there are moments where your mind, that, that little thing that you're trying to get out of the subconscious into the conscious it'll actually pull back like a fish on a line you know that just won't come in you can't get it in and land it so you get that idea out but the other person being there could actually get the the net pull it out and together you can you can ease out those ideas that you're actually trying to have so we've ended up in a kind of fishing type thing it's still the architects and i think having a collaboration which is what we're we're doing here is so important because you do have, it is like a wave, you're having your ups and downs, and we, we, we were out to see a short time doing a little bit of fishing. And those those supporting things can help give you that energy to go along. The work that we're doing is quite extensive. It's quite exhausting. There, When you're dealing with lots of different people that you have to do and think about the ways that they're thinking in different areas to keep them going, you are juggling and you can get worn out. And I think there's something that we've we've got to look into is where how do we get that balance so that we can rejuvenate our batteries? Garvin was talking about his camera battery <laughs> was a bit low. That's because we've done an extensive job during the earlier part of the week where we recorded something that lasted an hour and a half. And it, it, it was a wonderful experience. But at the same time, an hour and a half of discussion does take a lot out of you and it's taken a lot out of the equipment. So it's, it's something that, um, you know, when you're tired, you find that you're not thinking the way that you should be, and you, you need to make sure that you replenish your energies as much as any other any, any other vehicle that you're using, the car, and you know make sure the brakes are working properly, make sure the oil's in there so it doesn't run out of oil and suddenly go clunk, anything else. And, and we talked about the house, making sure that the maintenance are actually done there. So those are all key things, I think, that we're looking into and sort of trying to work through as we move our project forward. And it's exciting because... There's tons of stuff to be doing, and we're whittling away at it one step at a time. Now, what's interesting is you touched on the garden and you touched on the house and you touched on the business. Now, the strange thing in my house, the house and the garden, and is part of the business, or will will be for some of what we are going to do. Like uh, the house we have, we're going to have some like uh, we have a studio within it, and we have some accommodation, and we'll be holding retreats for our artists, friends, our creators, our writers, our producers, our directors, our our our, our, our workshops, our boot camps, and you know just somewhere to go for our for our intern crew to base themselves to then go out and work from. So. I'm going to have to do the garden. And this is back to the present. George visited this, this, this location a couple of years back and he said he walked up the drive and he said, ah, this it reminds me of my film school. Now, hope to God it wasn't uh, St. Trinian's or something like that <laughs> because I haven't painted the walls and the moss is there and the wife is always, excuse the French, using the, the word the wife, she's always saying, we must paint the outside. I'm go it's going to light up like a lighthouse if we paint the outside. Now, if I had the budget. Now, I have no budget. But if I have a budget, it's got a long list of things to do. And I'm always saying as an accountant, what do we do in what order? Now, we can paint the outside of a house and it'll look great. Or we can do an editing suite and have 16 PCs and do up that part. Or we can do up some of the accommodation, maybe earn some money out of it, as opposed to it looks nice from the outside. So if you have unlimited budget, you can do it all. You can pave the driveway, you can paint the outside of the house, you can have big flashlights on it, you can have the garden done, look, uh, done like the hard, hanging gardens of Babylon, and the inside will be like a five-star hotel. But with no budget, you're going to have to do masking tape and you know cornflakes boxes and it's what you it's shadows and 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 mirror smoke and mirrors you're going what can i get away with where can i put a minimum amount of budget and get a maximum reward so there's a certain element of things we're going to have to do so the approach to the house right i'll dress the driveway up a bit i'll make sure the grass is sharp and cut and people will get the feeling as they come in now the accommodation side i just done up a little bit on the last couple of weeks whereby my leisure time is my other work time so i'm not doing the business business i'm upstairs painting decorating for for 
for, for, for Ireland, in, in, as they say in a good old language. So, and what the gardening thing came to, well, again, I, I painted, I decorated, I cleaned, I repaired what I could with my limited tool set and zero budget. But the big holes in the wall and the, the things that needed that someone else expertise, which there's no budget for, I said, well, literally, how do we mask that? How do we hide it? How do we dress it up that it's not the only thing that's left? Because when you paint a wall, what happens is your eyes go to the dark patch. It doesn't see the new and the bright and the shiny. It sees the bit you missed. And the same with the garden. My wife is always saying that. I'm out there doing two acres of gardens. And she says, you didn't do the edge. And you might as well not have done it at all if you left the edges with all those hairy bits. Because that's showing someone just doing work, but not doing the bit that made the difference. It was that 80-20 rule again. Where did the value appear? It wasn't in the volume. It was in the touch-up pieces. It was in the finishing off. It was in the hide. If you can't fix it, hide it. Can you dress it up? Can you disguise it? But don't, for God's sake, leave it there with a big arrow pointing at it because that's the thing they're going to see it's as i said everything in airbnbs and trip and buys always was not with what was great it was what wasn't what they saw that didn't meet the criteria that caught their eye and annoyed them or niggled them and that's always a bit because when you're in a service industry you've got to be aware of what can go wrong what will annoy them with a disproportionate effect it might be one blanket less on a bed and they're cold and it ruined the whole holiday or the whole you know boot camp it wasn't what was great it was i was cold and that's what they remember so we we have this i've got the i have my list of things to do for my wife it's when i'm doing the gardening make sure you do the bloody edges don't tell me you did the garden unless you do both the middle and the sides or the edge and when you're painting and decorating somewhere don't just pick one wall do the four of them if you're going to do the four of them don't forget the ceiling and the skirtings because as soon as you painted them white the skirtings look yellow and and that's what you're going to see so it's all about branding it's all about minimum value it's it's your customer service proposition it's your customer experience don't do go nine tenths of the way and leave one piece totally up for grabs because you can be sure it's the first thing they see and the first thing they comment on and it has a 10x bad story behind it as opposed to the good keep everything just enough and the 80 all things have to be 80 20 not one, nine things to 80 20 and one i had no time for do everything bring the value everywhere and then give them no excuse to, to give out and then they had a good time across the board. And then you can be exceptional on 100%, 110% of something on something else. And they go, I had a great time overall. And this was a slice of cake and a piece of pie with cream on it and a cherry on top. What was really fascinating about what we're talking about here is that we're highlighting the fact that each of us in some form or fashion has a blind spot. There's a bit, we, we, we see the big picture, but in our eye, we have a blind spot. And what happens is the eye, the brain, covers up that blind spot with bits of information around what's going on just to fill it in. It's okay, they won't notice that bit. We just fill that bit in. And it's the blind spot that if you move over here, when, oh my goodness, now I can see that. So it's changing that little bit of perspective. We had discussed that a short time ago. But I think it's really quite key because one of the issues that I've been learning in, in counselling during the courses I've been doing is that when you get people to start talking about their story, what you're actually looking for as the counsellor is the blind spot, the bit they didn't see, the bit that they just can't seem to work out. And, and they're trying their hardest and they're putting all this effort in and they're doing they're doing all this work and they're, they're kind of going, I, I've done so much. But the, the one thing they couldn't see is the one thing is, as you said, somebody else spots. And that's why you need that other second pair of eyes to get a slightly different perspective just to give you that idea. Now, one of the things I also think was quite good about the, 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 the approach that Garvin and I are, are talking about, because Garvin has mentioned this quite a few times, it's the 80-20 rule. And, and it's that sort of 20% of your time, you, you'll, you'll actually get 80% of everything right. And the other 80% of your time, you'll get doing just fixing what is, you know, the 20%. It's, it's what people call me as being a perfectionist, and I'm not. It's just that... It's just when people sort of pick those up, they kind of go, oh, you have to be a perfectionist and get those. But they can see those little bits and pieces that I can't see. 
I mean, we're having a great thing at the moment where we're critiquing our interns' work at around about 430 sessions that we have. And quite often what's happened is their blind spots have, have not allowed them to see certain elements which shout out at us when we actually look at it. But for, for them, they can't see it and they'll keep on looking at it until someone points it out. They won't know that there was a slight issue there or a slight problem. And that's the same with, with everything that we're trying to do. We're, we're actually going through a process where we're saying, OK, there's got to be some blind spots in what we're doing. And with the two of us have worked on it, which is really good, because I know for a long time I, I've developed ideas for courses, developed ideas for schools and things like that. And, I, and, and it was me on my own. I went, ah, there must be some blind spots somewhere. But because Garvin and I have been working on it and looking at it from the two different perspectives, we're getting a good overview. And, there, and, there, and when we show it to other people now, what we're finding is that they're not seeing any blind spots in quite the way. And that's because we've worked again collaboratively. So it's but you still have to look to see. You have to go on the percept the assumption that there is you've got a blind spot somewhere that you can't see something. And it's that unknown that could actually trip you up. And, and you're looking to see if you can find what that is so that you don't get tripped up as you go on that kind of journey, you know. Is it that as you go out in the car to drive somewhere that one of your tires flat and it happens to be the passenger side tire <laughs> that you need to make sure is pumped up on a regular basis or, or you know, because alloy, alloy wheels cause all kinds of problems compared to the metal ones of the old days. You know, it's just those little things that you might have forgotten, simple little things that can actually trip you up and cause all kinds of problems. So I do think it's the blind spots. What we've actually been looking at very much through through this episode is is be more of an architect, enough to create those little areas where there's creativity that can go on, but not so much where the creativity creativity could be like the ivy that we've got around the back here that could get all over the place and cause a mess. And before you know it, you're actually fighting so much ivy to try and contain it that you're now losing your way to find the end of the journey because you're fighting something you just can't fight with. And in a way, that's the garden that you were talking about there. It, it becomes so overwhelming that you're, you're putting so much effort in. And then the little bit, the little edge that would have actually just looked quite nice and neat. Someone would have, if you just cut that in the first place, they might have noticed that more than anything else. So I think that's, that's the kind of key thing. So we're going to be starting to look for people to come and go on the journey with us who will start to see the architecture that we're trying to design, because we've talked about the fact that if you if you do design something, you can you can manage your budget and it won't go over the top. If you can figure out in the early stages where those issues that may arise that could throw your 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 budget up the left, then you can tackle them. And it's again, Garvin has said quite a few times, don't go in for the deep dive, especially if you haven't got the oxygen tank on the back because you may not be aware of where all the dangers are. Look at the shallow surface initially, scheme out what's going on, look to see what the dangers are before you jump in. And then you can solve those problems and you can be equipped with whatever you need. We've had sharks in the backgrounds of some of our images before. <laughs> and I know we, we just put something up with a shark and I was kind of going, you know, do we fear the aliens? And I kind of go, no, I think I'm going to fear that shark that's sitting there. We need to be prepared for that shark. And it actually goes back to one of our early stories was about the bear and the cave. And if you, there were the three characters that were in there, that one of them was so positive he ran outside and got et by the bear straight away. The other one was so frightened that he stayed in and died because he was so scared to go outside. But the third person had a positive attitude. He'd actually seen what had happened to the other guy, realized there was an issue, and then thought, well, I'd better design myself a weapon. So as the, he went outside, he'd created a club and belted the bear around the head and ran away. So he was prepared. He knew what to do. He knew what all the problems were, and he was able to solve those problems. And that was because he planned a course of action. And that's what we are now doing, co co planning a course of action so that we can achieve our goals that we want to do. And we will then be able to, we know there's going to be obstacles in the way, and we're, we're prepared for them, and we'll adjust our sights as necessary and move around those obstacles so we can get carry on course to get and achieve our goals. And that's the key thing. And with the writers, we want writers to start to come and talk to us because we want to work with them to show them what our model is so that they can start preparing their scripts to fit within our budgetary constraints, because that's what we have. We have a constraint. Our budget is a very small budget. But within that low budget, 
we can come up with really high concepts that really entertain the people that are our audience. And we can focus on what who that audience is and make a specific film for that audience so they know exactly what to expect out of a story. They may not know what the story actually is. We don't want it to be, you know, f overly familiar, but they'll know what the genre is and we'll work within that and we'll entertain them and they'll be pleased with it. And that's our goal. But you have to work within a certain, you can't be a gardener, I think, in that to one. You have to be an architect. No, maybe not. Now I'm thinking, you see, it's back to, if you think of the Chelsea Gardens, we, want, we don't want creativity to go run amok. We want to package creativity within a certain set of parameters or limitations. But you have to shine. We're saying Chelsea Garden and those shows, it's all about, you know, bamboozle us or like spectacular this, that and the other. But it, it's not just a, a big pile of everything spectacular because then you end up seeing nothing. It might be the, the bonsai is the limited and minimalization nearly is the art form itself. But then the other side is what can I achieve that will absolutely you know amaze you in this small space that I'm assigned to then go create. So ours is, a per, we're saying, it's not that it's a small budget, it's a massive budget to someone that has no budget or no access to budget. What we're saying is, if you're creative, yeah, well now target your creativity to show and be ha and testimonial in this space and in this timeline. It's not limit yourself. This like you're still creative and you have all those ideas. But we have to package ideas. We have to package creativity, and it has to be within the language of budget or monetization or package or brand or limitation. It's not everything for everyone because everything is nothing. If, if, if we're now we're back to the opposite of the conversation at the beginning, we need a creative something, not a creative everything or a creative anything. It's the creative something that's on budget, on target, on testimonial within the timeline. And that sort that basically is your own testimonial of your creativity. If you have one dance, you better go out there and do the, you know, whatever that dance is. I, I, I don't know if it's grease lightning or, or, <laughs> or the chicken dance or there's all the dances out there. But if you have one dance and one chance, make it a good one. It's to exhibit your potential creativity, the taste of you, your style, your art within that timeline, within that budget, within that set of parameters. And that's the same of any product out there, any business out there, the back to the minimum value proposition. We know we can do a whole lot of something, but if we can do, yes, if you have every budget and if you're staffed and the customers are looking for it, but if you can only do one thing all day long, that's you and you're the expert and you own that space and you're limited to one thing. What's the one thing that's you all day long? That's your one chance dance. That's get out there and do the funky chicken. And then you're going, this is me. This is as good as it gets. If this is not good enough, <laughs> nothing else I have is going to make any impression on you. So make good first impressions last. Make it a good one. That's what we're saying. I think um, what, what's interesting is that um, there have been low-budget films that have turned the, the genres upside down. Um, they have had no money. They had to be creative in the way that they, they designed the shots and what they were doing and how they were doing it. But whenever those same people were given a massive budget, they just went all over the place. They couldn't, they couldn't control themselves. They'd, so, so having a big budget isn't always uh, a good thing because I think that's where people don't know how to design things. They go over the top and then it, things cost far more than what they expected. The low budget, the restrictions of the low budget, I think creates is, is more creative because you, you do have to think through how am I going to make the most out of the money that I've actually got? Where should it go? And if you plan that beforehand, again, with some of the script writers that uh, I was seeing on this show called Film Courage, what they were saying was, if you understand that you're working with a producer that has a limited budget, it doesn't matter how big that budget is, it's still limited to what you can actually do on screen. You've, you've, got, to, you've got to work with that process that, that they have. And you may not like certain aspects of it, but you can get those hard bits that you find hard out the way quickly that gives you some sense of structure you've got a framework and one of the things i found is that once you worked out all the scenes or the sequences 
as long as you begin where the you make the have it begin at a certain point and have a certain scene end at a certain point what happens in the middle can be very very creative as long as you end up at the end so you can get to the next scene and take the journey on and i think that becomes that becomes quite important and it, it also becomes exciting because you 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 do have a chance to be playful within the restrictions and, and i've always found that with lots of films and projects i've worked on they haven't been big budgeted projects but the creativity comes because you're you're looking at ways to to challenge yourself in what you're doing and then also challenge your audience so they're getting to see something new and something fresh that they're not bored with the visuals they're actually getting to see and they're not bored with the sound or the music they're, they're saying oh this is just a formula that you sometimes see it's it's looking at things from a different set of eyes which is where the different perspective going away from the blind spots that sometimes the blind spot is that you think you're so rigid and i know a lot of new people to to writing and filmmaking they kind of go oh we want to break we want to break all the all the rules and you kind of go yeah okay that's fine but do you understand the rules in the first place because they're there to help guide you and it is a guide to working through the process and once you've got the structure right you can be so creative in what you're doing and we've talked about houses if you don't have a good foundation to build your house on the house will fall down and i think that's the same with the story if you don't have a good foundation process for developing your story your story will fall apart at some point and you'll or you'll get lost and you won't know how to solve those problems and part of that is because people do what garvin said is they've gone for a deep dive and and they've just run ahead with themselves and they haven't teased out the idea and the shape and then kind of go oh now we've got that now i can work on it and i can and i don't need to worry about this bit over here because this little bit here i can now concentrate on oh i've got eight hours to do that right i'll concentrate on that and then tomorrow's eight hours i can do that if if it's an eight hour block or if it's a four hour block you kind of go i've only got four hours for that i've only got four hours for that bit you can calculate it but you can be creative in that time and your your energy levels will work appropriately because you're focused on just doing that one little bit just there and i think that's that's a good way of actually working things i'm reminded of the three little piggies believe it or not yes and what it is is forget the big wolf and the huff and the puff and i'll blow your house down it's the straw house the stick house and probably the concrete block house but at the end of the day they all built on their foundations the beginning and the planning stage was you know finding probably the materials at hand or a different budget but one it was the vision board at the end it was do you want the longevity if you're going to put the effort in on the foundations make them strong make them long make them last and then you can all move in with the piggy number three in the sense of he had the solid foundations they could all go live on he probably had three or four extra bedrooms but the other two were huffed and puffed away by the big bad wolf they were gone and they were dangerous and they were a wreck and they wouldn't be insurable at the best of times in these markets and you know might not, they wouldn't get flood insurance anyway or fire insurance but you got the, the third piggy, had they all done the same thing? They were all the same starting point. They were all little piggies. They all had to build a house. And they probably all had a similar budget. And the budget might have been time. And one got lazy and one just got what the materials to hand. So it's have the vision, have the budget, have the plan. And know what the journey is and what do you want it to last. You want to sort of build it on solid foundations, have a nice front garden. And what do you want to have the friends and relatives over? But therefore, it's a bigger house a smaller house it's it's more rigid it's more structured if it's a mobile home if you want to chuck it on the back of a truck and be able to drive it off afterwards even better but you had a plan and you succeeded it wasn't just go do us something and build shelter that's what the other two were doing one a little bit better than the other but not really with visionary planning for longevity and that's what we're doing we're built we're not building on straw we're not building it in wood we're building it in you know you know stronger metal i don't know whether it's concrete you know i think it's more going to be a lasting metal of some description that goes on forever and can sort of weigh, worn worn off you know sort of from wolves to water to fire to whatever it will survive the, the damage done by an event it won't the business won't fail on the back of of the weather or or something happening we can rebuild we can move we can adapt this the structure 
is 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 still there. It's pliable. It's malleable. It's movable. It's 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 rebuildable. Uh, and, and it's and that's what it is. The bricks actually. I suppose with the bricks, you could have took them, knocked them all down, but you could have put them back together again. And you might just cement them stronger. And that's what we'll be doing. If we get huffed and puffed and knocks our brick house down, we'll be putting it back up stronger with maybe better materials and 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 with more budget at hand. But it's it's the three little piggies. There's only two of us at the moment. We don't know who the third blood bloke is or girl or whoever. But we we're all going to be not going to be building building wanting shelters. It's going to be building super structures with limited budget and a plan. What this is really all about is security. Funny enough, that you're actually planning mm-hmm. for a secure future in one form or fashion. Whether it's the garden, whether it's the house, whether it's the journey, being secure that you know that you get to the other end of that journey. I think that's that's the important thing. And we're looking for the security in, and that's that, you know, minimizing the risk in the structure of a story so that at the end of the day, we'll have something that's quite solid. Now, I'm actually beginning to realize that we're coming to the end of a little story that we've having this week. We started off with the idea of the architect and the gardener. And in, in our discussion we can quite often see, and I know that my dad was a gardener, that he designed a lot of his stuff. So he was more of an architect that used gardening as his craft. And we talked about the Chelsea show and all the things that are going on there. And the amount of architecture and design and craft work that goes in that to make sure that it's a pleasing thing. They're also working to their audience, which is what we were discussing with the idea of the scriptwriter. That as you come to make a film, you're also thinking of your audience and, and what their audiences need. And again, going back to our garden, each of our gardens, Garvin was talking about the the guests that will come to his house and whether or not their stay would be pleasing. And what we were working out was if you took a slight sidestep, you could see the blind spots that we each individually had and need to accommodate so that we could make sure that we do have the right perspective, branding, whatever it is, to encourage our clients, our you know, guests to come and and view our films, stay at our locations and enjoy the experience of life that we hope to give them in some form or fashion. That's that's where we're going. So we are coming to the end. So I'll say cheerio from me and from Garvin, the last words. Always cut the edges. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications. 